So I think, um, well, not so much thanks, frankly, to Palgrave Macmillan, <laughs> who um, was supposed to be producing books here, in charge of the distribution of it. But uh, hopefully, um, as Valero says, they will may appear during the course of this session. Um, thanks also, I have to say, to Oxfam, um, which um, um, helped cover our travel expenses while we were in um, in, um, in Bolivia and also paid for um, the translation, because the book is going to shortly to appear um, in translation in La Paz, um, in Spanish. Um, and I'm supposed to be on my way now to um, a week or so's time.
time to the La Paz Book Fair to launch it there. Let's hope it's, uh, it actually appears. And I'd like to say it's, very, it's, it's a shame that we haven't got uh, my co-author here, Anne Chaplin, who we've, I've known for more years than I care to think about now. Um, we first worked together on, in, in, in and on Bolivia in the late 1970s. Um, and she is somebody who is very well versed in terms of popular movements and so forth in, in Bolivia. So it was, a great, it was a great pleasure to be able to, um, to work with her on this project. Now, the inspiration of the book um, came from a book that I wrote, um, which was published back in 2004, which some of you may have seen, called um, Patterns of Protest, um, which was published by the uh, Latin American <coughs> Bureau in London. But we also did a, a little share of a book with Cole Waller, I think it was, so anyway, some, some time back, um, which was um, an attempt to make sense of the plethora of uh, protest movements which took place in Bolivia between roughly between 2000, well, 1999 and 2003, the Chabamba Water War terminating in the, the um, Alteño Gas War, um, which was a book which was designed to be accessible. Um, it was not designed as a sort of academic text as such, but it was designed to be accessible to a wider Leadership. It was fairly short, deliberately short. It was simply written <coughs> and um, economically priced, which I think is a very good combination of a book, unfortunately, only too rare these days, uh, particularly on the price side of it. Uh, but it was also a book which um, aimed to be academically respectable and which does, um, was to be used to um, help in terms of, of um, um, work in, in, in universities um, around the place um, as, a, as a teaching tool. And in a sense, um, this book um, became the model for the book which we are launching today, which is called uh, Bolivia Processes of Change. I take case to add processes, plural, of change, which I will become clear of what I mean by that in a short while. Um, so this book is, is related to the previous book, but it's but somewhat, um, somewhat different in, in its approach. And I must say, writing it was far more challenging. It was much more difficult um, to write, I think, um, because of so many of the ambiguities of the situation in, in Bolivia. But it seeks to, um, in terms of its subject matter, um, it seeks to answer questions like, how has social organization developed since 2005, when the mass government was, was first elected? Um, how do these developments relate to um, past patterns of social organization in, in Bolivia? Um, and what have been the experiences of those involved in social movements and or in NGOs working with popular movements in the last few years? Um, and to what extent have these experiences been positive or negative um, in the eyes of those intimately involved in them? And how, finally, on, it, it, was, it seeks to, to, to show how this experience um, varied from one part of another, um, uh, one part of Bolivia to another. In other words, the question of processes of change, uh, multiple processes of change. So this is not a book about Eva Morales. Um, others have written um, good books on, on, on Evo. Um, nor is it a chronicle of the mass government as such, though hopefully it um, is a contribution to the growing literature that assesses the achievements and limitations of the mass administration. And the task involved in doing this book, I think, has been made um, more complicated and more difficult by um, the polarization of debate on and around Bolivia in the recent years. I'm sure you must be aware in the mainstream U.S. media that you know, the government of Evo Morales doesn't get a terribly good press, in the mainstream press at least in this country. But in particular, um, what has taken place in Bolivia and the analysis of what has taken place in Bolivia in recent years has become the subject of often quite acrimonious um, debate within the country itself. And often I think this is a debate that is tinged, uh, not a li little bit, but quite a lot, by the sort of political positions that people adopt. I mean, it's not ends up not being an attempt to understand what's going on in Bolivia, but rather to take political positions and 
use those to sort of interpret um, interpret what's going on around differing political agendas. So our approach has um, uh, been to um, try to get beyond um, some of this often these often polarized debates that have emerged in recent years and that reflect the political confrontations that have taken place. It has been to wherever possible, as far as possible, to let ordinary people speak for themselves in this, both in terms of their negative and positive appreciations of what um, being involved in social movements has meant for them. Um, its attempt is to try to focus on some of the new contradictions that have emerged in Bolivia in recent years, and try to understand their causes, and how has history, in a sense, moved on, because many of the contra contradictions that emerged in Bolivia, in the, um, which were the subject of the previous book, have to a certain extent been resolved. But new and interesting contradictions have emerged um, as a result of that, so that, that reconciliation, if you like, that, that process of, of, of uh, resolving those, those contradictions. Our approach is also to, dis to stress the diversity of conditions and contexts in which uh, social movements have evolved, thereby the, the notion of processes of change Bolivia is not just the Altiplano, um, which is often seen by outsiders as being sort of, you know, what is typically Bolivian, um, but we have uh, um, made an attempt to try to visit um, a number of differing realities of different places within, around the country and to investigate these very different realities. And finally, what we our approach is to, to try to link the, the, the present, or at least the contemporary, to the past historical legacies, and we argue strongly that the experiences of the uh, recent past cannot be properly understood without references to the patterns of change and the perceptions derived from those um, patterns of change over the last 50 or 60 years. And this, I think, relates to the question of, which is sometimes difficult to define and or to, to, to uh, nail down in sort of statistical terms, but nevertheless still exists, is what we you know, understand by the political culture of a country. Now, in terms of its structure, the book is structured on a sort of geographic logic. There are seven chapters uh, which look at seven different geographical contexts, uh, which reflect different realities. We've tried to look at um, highlands versus lowland, urban versus rural, and we visited um, the chapters, specific chapters on the Altiplano, on El Alto, on Potosí, on the coca-producing areas of the Chapari, but also a bit on the Yungas, on the Tari on Tarica and the Chaco, on Santa Cruz, and finally on the uh, Amazonian North, the department of Pando and the um, provin the pro provincia of uh, Bacadillas in the north of the Beni, which is a different <laughs> different um, understood reality in Bolivia altogether. I think it's the first time I've ever been to. Pando, which is a very interesting experience for. But around this geographical logic is to try to uh, um, mix this with specific themes, um, but built around a general theme of popular organization in its various different guises. The first two chapters of the book you will find are rather more general in their focus. Um, the first is on a brief history of popular organization and its significance in Bolivian history. Um, since the time of the 1952 revolution, and why Bolivia stands out in Latin America for the strength and militancy of its social movements. And the second chapter is related specifically to the question of land and land ownership, and people's divergent conceptions of land ownership, and how these underscore or have underscored conflicts over access to and the use of raw materials. And in this context, the Atipnis dispute has become probably the best known disputes outside Bolivia, but there are many others which uh, um, are related to uh, questions of, of land ownership and the use of land. So our, our journey, we were in, the, the, the research for this book was done between February of um, 2012 and um, August of, of 2012, which was um, a period of um, considerable amount of conflict. Um, in fact, everything sort of bubbled up when we arrived and sort of calmed down when we left. I don't know if there's any causal, <laughs> causal connection, but, but um, there was, it was certainly a time of, of mobilization and quite strong mobilization 
against the government at one on a, different, on a variety of different issues. But it was, I think, for this reason, actually a very interesting and useful time to be there, um, looking at the difficulties of engineering a process of change and looking at the contradictions that can emerge from that process of change. Um, it, for me, it was a, a, a great opportunity too. It was great fun to write this book. Um, it, sorts of places which I've never been to before. I've never really been to the Chaco before, and I've never been to the Chiquitania in Santa Cruz before, and I've never been to the northern part, the Amazonian part of, of Bolivia either. So it was, for me, it was a kind of, you know, it was a very interesting to visit work, is, is interviewing people. Briefly, a little bit about some of the conclusions we reach, uh, different protests one by one, which have been affected by the uh, process of fragmentation of um, social together rather different feats. And that is sort of certain. Secondly, I would slightly overly kind of Venezuela on, on populism, really affected by the kinds of organization, the kinds of um, demands being made by popular organization at a grassroots level. And that Morales is somebody who is very closely attuned to those kinds of, of demands. And Morales, and I think, has had to listen to the social, what the social movements tell him. And he's way aware of that, I think. Um, so I think it's a, it's a far cry from being um, a, 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 a story of, of top-down reformism. Thirdly, I think it's fair to say that um, people's material conditions in the country have improved at different levels of society and across in different, um, different parts of the country. Bolivia has seen um, several years since about 2004 of fairly sustained growth, I mean certainly by Bolivian standards, extremely positive growth and um, you know, I think in this, in this year they're, they're predicting a sort of 5 to 6 percent growth rate which is pretty good by most Latin American standards and that's been something that's been ongoing now for a number of years. So there's been a, 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 um, a story of growth, there's been an enormous increase in public investment which has been a sort of one of the motors of growth but which has also had the effect of um, affecting um, employment and wages. Um, we have seen one of the questions we ask people is, you know, how, how they feel materially, what, you know, how their incomes have gone up. And I think it's one of the sort of common features of just about everywhere in the country that people's incomes are now substantially higher um, than they were um, six or seven years ago. And of course, we, part of this is looking at um, some of the targeted social policies which have um, emerged weren't invented by Evo, but um, have been um, increased under Evo's administration, particularly um, things like the Renta Dignidad, which is a payment to everybody over the age of 60, um, whether in the Campo or not, um, but which has um, had an important um, bearing on terms of, 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 of family um, of income particularly in rural areas. But there are other number of other targeted benefit schemes as well towards um, pregnant women and towards um, people and uh, kids with um, middle school age. Um, but having said that, um, I think one of the other things that became clear from many of the people we talked to, that there, a lot of people are dissatis still dissatisfied with their, their situation and their position and position in society. And I think that here yeah, there's a, a real problem of the kind of high expectations that the government has generated um, over the years. Um, in rural areas, um, and one of the things we look at in the chapter on land uh, issues, there has been um, an important degree of, of um, land redistribution, and this has had definitely had a positive impact on um, people's um, welfare conditions in, in the rural areas. However, having also having said that, there obviously remain huge social problems and there are whole areas where one felt that um, the policy had really not been, had, had meant very little to people and one of the areas that stands out in this regard is to, uh, of, of people living in the Altiplano who see very little difference in terms of the, the, their own standards of living. This is one of um, Evo's key electoral um, bases and, and therefore politi political importance but there is certainly a feeling that they have gained very little um, in terms of higher prices for what they produce. Um, and one of the reasons for this, I think, is that um, uh, increasingly in an urbanized society, um, uh, 
relying on highly, very improductive agriculture in the Altiplano is simply not enough to, to feed the population properly. And there is a tension here between the rural and the urban. Um, and of course, there are uh, major problems like in, in, the, in El Alto, where you know, uh, uh, the large majority of the population live in the informal sector um, without proper employment, without any proper provisions of come through employment and where um, people are, um, have great expectations of, of, of getting jobs and this is not this has not been taking place um, possibly changes in the area of social inclusion of women inclusion uh, relating to um, and I think this of the last few years have made it possible to disregard the question of the Constitution and the Constitution when you feel when you ask uh, <laughs> <laughs> it thought at the outset is how to actually the, um, which have certainly support for modernity amongst indigenous peoples. He's one of us, he, by virtue of his social origin and his background, who um, has become increasingly still the mass that attracts a strong following. Um, but in Santa Cruz, I think things have changed a good deal. Um, and um, it's certainly not the case that this is an area which is still controlled by a small elite, um, that people's voting preferences are um, conducted by um, the politics of people like the Comité Pro Santa Cruz. The size of the vote for um, the mass in Santa Cruz in 2009 was very sizable. It was nearly 50%. And indeed, I mean, in, the, in the distribution of seats for Santa Cruz, it's the mass has 50% of, of the seats, and the, the other parties have 50%. So it's very evenly divided within Santa Cruz. So I think that this idea that, you know, the, work, the kind of black and white dichotomous um, uh, media luna is um, something that we need to revise a bit in the way we think about Bolivia. Then I would say that the, that, uh, the spirit of nationalism in Bolivia, which of course goes back decades um, to the time of the MNR and the, and the 52 revolution and even before then, is still alive and well. And Evo um, is somebody who's managed to um, um, tap into the two important traditions. One, an indigenous campesino tradition, and another, a tradition of, of nationalism, um, by seeming, at least, to stand up for Bolivia's interests. This is an important part of his legitimacy. Evo is seen as somebody who is prepared to go the extra mile to um, stand up for sovereignty of the country. And of course, that, to understand that, you have to understand where Bolivia was coming from previously, where um, it seemed that um, the country was ruled by the IMF, the World Bank, and um, the um, Drug Enforce Enforcement Administration, at least in the interest that they expressed. Um, and finally, I think what I would say is that some, as I said, intimated at the beginning that um, that many of the old contradictions, or some of the old contradictions have been resolved or eased, but the new contradictions have emerged. Firstly, there's a tension, I think, between pursuing pro-indigenous, pro-environmental -environment, agendas and Bolivia's reliance on exporting gas and minerals. And nowhere is this, for, for, in terms of the places we visited, was this clearer than in Tarica, which is, of course, where 80% of the gas is located. Indeed, I think this is something that lies behind also the conflict of Latipnis. Secondly, I think there's a tension between um, the need, um, which has belatedly been recognized, to grant a degree of, uh, recognized by the mass, that is, to, to grant a degree of decentralization, and the need, but how to do that, and at the same time, not to give all the way to your, your opponents. And this has is, this is been a tricky balancing act and I think it's one that the mass has come, in, come to learn that had to be done as a result of the kind of upsurge that took place in 2008 in Santa Cruz and other parts of the East and Lowlands. Um, but, I mean, who do you decentralize to? How much power do you, in fact, decentralize? And I think this is a, a, a constant tension which the government is finding itself having to manage. Then there's the tension between extending indigenous rights, um, particularly with regard to the Constitution, um, how to do this in practice, but at the same time to keep on board um, an urban middle class for whom this agenda means very little, or not, uh, um, for whom 
this is not central to their own particular um, um, uh, interests. Um, indeed, how to, to, to maintain the integrity of, of the original alliance on which the mass victory in 2005 was based. Then there's a tension between the need for land distribution and that of ensuring cheap food to an increasingly urbanized population tension I've referred to before, um, where most food production is now in the hands of large landowners in Santa Cruz. Um, how to tackle rural poverty in the highlands where production is essentially competitive. How to push the, the agendas of agrarian reform but without upsetting the landholders, the large landholders of Santa Cruz. This is a difficult, difficult one which the government had to to wrestle with. Then there's the tension between playing the nationalist card in local politics without alienating foreign partners on whom um, Bolivia depends. Uh, this is particularly important in terms of relations with Brazil. Um, but, but one of the things I think that, that, that uh, Evo has happened, managed to do is to extend the number of countries with which uh, Bolivia has an active engagement of one kind or another. It's much less than it was simply relations with Brasilia relations with Washington is a whole diversity of, 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 of international partners that have emerged. And then finally, um, there's the tension between um, what you might call the individualization of government, i.e. the concentration of power and authority in the hands of one person, and the need for institutionalization. And this is nowhere this is more important in terms of the politics of succession. And as you probably know, um, Evo has uh, decided to run again for the presidency um, next year. Indeed, the campaign is already underway. Um, but ultimately, and I'm sure that um, Evo must be aware of this from the experience of Venezuela, but are aware than most, that ultimately you have to work out some mechanism whereby you can hand over power to somebody else without your whole legacy blowing up in your face. So I think these are, these are some of the ongoing difficulties that the government is having to wrestle with. So anyway, let me leave it there. I think I've yes, uh, nearly extended my welcome. So you came in just under 30 minutes. So thank you very much for that <coughs> presentation, John. If I understood the hand signals that I was getting from Adam, he has gone to get your books. Oh, wonderful! So we'll see. <laughs> but now he's gone and he hasn't come back. So <laughs> <laughs> he hasn't been kidnapped. <laughs> Excuse me, Kevin. We turn it over to you. Okay. Well, it's a great pleasure to be here on this panel with John and. and presenting this book. I think I'm very excited about this book. Um, I've already got it into my syllabus for this year's class that I'm teaching right now, so we're trying to, I'm trying to incorporate it as quickly as possible. I'd like to thank Wola for hosting this. Um, you know, I, I think back to Evo Morales' one visit to Washington when John uh, Walsh here organized at American University uh, his presentation, American U, and it was really the presentation of the Washington community, this indigenous president of Bolivia and created a lot of fascination along lines outside of AU <laughs> and a closed circuit for telecast. And so it brings back memories of that. And also I was with John last summer when he was working on the research of this book. And that's why I'm kind of amazed. These years go by fast, but here I'm all up and the book is here. And I was just thought he was talking to him about some of the early research. Well, you have to move fast with books about Bolivia because Bolivian politics can change rather than <laughs> <That's laughs> well, well, move more fast than publication schedules. That's the great thing because this thing is really a uh, one, almost a one year current, and um, it's hard to find a book like that. You, you start teaching on Bolivia, and then things have changed by the time you get your syllabus organized, you start lecturing and so forth. So it's really nice to have something so current covers such a long period of the Morales uh, period of Professor de Cambio, one of the poems. So I, I think uh, that's a really, it's a really welcome volume to the uh, Latin American and Bolivia studies uh, uh, literature in the United States. Um, I, I, I'm, Really very positive about this book. I, I enjoyed it immensely. Uh, it synthesized a tremendous amount of material, and about, for me, are all the key issues and key questions uh, are just about Bolivia today and what this process is involving. So I think it's the best book on the market. If you want to quote me, one of your blurbs. Ooh, <laughs> <laughs> best book on the market. It's uh, particularly good because I think John also is operating very good networks. I mean, I'm just amazed he said he's doing some of these departments for the first time, but he obviously had great contacts and great networks through organizations like CIPA, NGOs have long experience and deep experience in Bolivia with these issues and, and the development challenges and so forth. And it's really the quality of the people you're able to contact, social leaders, uh, NGO leaders, some really interesting mayors, um, party activists of different kinds uh, to get a, uh, I noticed you didn't interview any any ministers of state, 
but um, it was really a grassroots view of, of what's going on. And that's what I like about the book. Um, we really get a sense of what's going on out there in the hinterland and not just in the capital and all the debates going on, the high levels of policy and so forth. So this is a, a very rich take and some very articulate people who are very well informed, a lot of interesting experiences and people from obviously social organizations and their allies who have been working with them and local government, um, local leaders, a lot of women leaders who have emerged in recent years are also quoted extensively in the book. This really is a, enriches the, the material considerably. You know, I think he, as you, he's laid out, as you can see, he asked really good questions, really tough questions about quality of life changes, and he weren't, they weren't, he didn't just get easy answers, he pushed people to give them some real uh, substance behind their answers to uh, indicate what's, what's really happened. So we really get a good sense of, he doesn't hesitate to word, use the word achievements and, and, and shortcomings, even though there's no real quantitative data backing up a lot of these statements, you have a, you trust the people you're hearing from, you think they are balanced and, and very uh, insightful uh, in the kinds of uh, answers they're giving and the kinds of commentary they're giving on Bolivian life today. Um, so it really takes us on a tour of the kind of constituencies the MAS is trying to reach out to and seeing what do they say? Well, what, what does this all amount to after seven, six or seven years? Um, and he finds a lot of interesting things and a lot of things that I hear about my trips um, were confirmed and a lot of uh, issues were deepened and I found the analysis very enriching to be able to uh, understand better what I was hearing as well. So the, I, what I like about the book as a development sociologist is that he talks about benefits generated, quality of benefits, sustainability of benefits, you know, three key areas of Bolivian life today in terms of the development processes that are underway. Um, he doesn't do a quantitative analysis of political benefits. There could be a whole chapter on that and all the political inclusions taking place at all levels of the state and the ministries and all these other places. He doesn't really get into that. And um, in a sense, I, I like it because he sticks to this more developmental track. Um, there are some indication of that, but you can do a very systematic analysis and to build this whole case for political inclusion, which would be quite impressive to see all the different <coughs> places and appointments and, 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 and role of uh, the uh, marginalized sectors now in, in the state apparatus and local, regional, uh, national. And again, as he's told you in, the, in his, um, his major questions, he doesn't hesitate to really deal with the cleavages and conflicts over natural resource control that are happening within the Mas's own constituency, happening on the, uh, after a new constitution has been uh, uh, approved, crowning all these indigenous rights, environmental rights, and so forth. And then you've got all these cleavages and conflicts, so the complexity of this, this situation. Um, sometimes I wonder when watching these conflicts between the organizations in the Andean Highlands and the Lowlands is this, you know, get, seeing the old narrative of, of Andean colonization being played out again, sort of new clothing, but it's really at the heart of it is Andean indigenous having to go into the Lowlands to find lands, to invading lands of Lowland indigenous, and this has been a policy that goes back to the 1950s with the MNR and certainly the military governments. And so we're at least seeing this played out on a new stage today, uh, these same conflicts over the whole issue is by Antipnis and, and other parts of the Oriente and, and southern Bolivia. Um, I agree the sense of political and social inclusion is, is powerfully uh, made. The, the case for that in the book um, it comes up, out more and more the sense of citizenship, the sense that this is a new society we're part of now, and lots of barriers to cultural, gender, and uh, racial discrimination have fallen for many people, and that's not something you can I think it'd be nice to get some real quantified academic literature on the subject to, to show how deep and broad it is and um, to get a better base um, with quantitative data as well. You know, the issue of racism, for example, is kind of the genie out of the bottle. Now it's a public issue to be talked about. It can be addressed. You know, Academics can work on it. It's a legitimate research issue and so forth. Before it was kind of hush-hush. Nobody wanted to talk about it. And only in private, there are all these racist remarks and so forth. And, and so now it seems to me it's a public issue that can be dealt with. It's not necessarily being dealt with effectively so far, but it, nonetheless, it, um, it is impressive to see this happen, and perhaps that's only an indigenous-led government could make this happen, we bring this out, or have the courage to bring it out, because it has been a, something under the a subterranean issue. It's there festering in societies like Bolivia and Peru and Colombia, but now it's out of the open. We can deal with it. We can start talking about policies and deal with it, what it really is. Um, we're, 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 and the book highlights you know, some of the groups of economic gains for mine workers, coca growers, informal sector workers, 
peasants in Tarija through the, the cash transfers, construction workers as a major beneficiary. Uh, and I want to talk in a minute about the quinoa producers. And, we, and John, throughout the book, talks about the spread of educational benefits to a lot of places in Bolivia that didn't receive these benefits before, and even health services appearing in more remote communities and so forth. Um, although you didn't talk about the Cuban contribution to that, or uh, which would be interesting if you saw any evidence of that being a significant part of the health uh, sector uh, development uh, impact. And I, I agree, I think one of the pieces that seems very clear in the book is Bolivia will never be the same again for the better. And then, again, as these barriers fall and people are able to become more energized as citizens and find new roles and participate more widely in society, that it's, you can't go back. It's not something reversible, um, no matter who, who comes into power. Um, and again, but however, you know, we have very significant, in this book, very significant caveats to these achievements and, um, and the overall examination of the development equation that many of us are looking for with this government. I mean, we have a, a government led by an indigenous peasant from a rural society, from born in Oruro, had extensive contact with Cochabamba Valley's while we were in got to know all of Bolivia's rural development problems through the Confederación Unica Sindicato uh, network throughout Bolivia, um, very familiar with articulating these issues, arguing, making demands on these issues, and so forth. And so, um, one of the high standards I guess this kind of government sets for itself is to really deal effectively with the rural development problems in areas like the Alpi Plano, the Andean Valleys, and Chukisaka, and Bocasi, and, and Cochabamba, to really create some models that are viable, can really raise the level of living of farmers, farmers and create a sense of dignity about living in the countryside, and also uh, not only productivity and production, but also sustainability. And so this has been in my mind, one of the big disappointments, because it seems to me we had a, the political conditions and a person president and, and some of his appointments, certainly in the first period, um, that had a very hopeful view and a very experienced with people recruiting from institutions like CIPCA, a Jesuit NGO that existed for you know, decades in major regions of Bolivia that has a wealth of experience uh, working on rural development problems, a lot of detailed knowledge about local conditions and, and obstacles to support. Some of these people were brought into the government, and yet um, it hasn't gelled into having a really a strong a small farmer rural development strategy that's sustainable. Um, one of the errors, I think, was excluding COEC. Now, COEC is a network of economic organizations at the grassroots that have been evolving in the last two decades on a whole wide range of crops and livestock and so forth, and they've got very advanced programs, and they have a national organization, regional organizations, and various serious grassroots leaders working on these development issues with the wealth experience and commitment and, and skill, and yet the government chose to work more through state institutions and trying to create agricultural marketing entities and so forth, rather than working through these COEC, which I think was a mistake. I think now we're seeing overtures to COEC, which I found very positive, maybe electorally motivated, but it could lead to some new uh, strategic alliances which are going to be necessary if we're going to tackle these uh, highland rural development problems. Um, Again, it's not, as though, it's not a coherent strategy and you don't see a lot of significant impacts. And yet, despite that, the government is reaching out and funding here and there grassroots organizations that weren't able to get access to the state resource before. And I, I talked about El Sebo, a famous case of uh, cacao producers who produce their own chocolate and sell it on world markets. Um, they have 23 stores they're selling to in, in, fair, fair, in, in Whole, Whole Foods right now. Um, and we have... Um, uh, uh, Yama breeder, Yama herder associations that have also received resources from the state for the first time, as that has been elevated to a strategic resource, right? But I think what's missing is kind of an incorporation of a lot of the installed capacity which groups like seek, and not just an individual, but the installed capacity they have working at the local level, to try to build partnerships with civil society, even with private enterprise, to help tackle the market more effectively, to um, to break this, break this, um, this bottleneck in the rural areas are really freeing up the rural producer to be able to participate more widely in the economy and have a, a, a dignified level of living and really participate effectively in the economy. I, I think I hope in the next administration they will put emphasis on this this part of the of the development quantity the government's dealing with because it's and it would seem natural that there is the political will. I think now there's got to be the political savvy and the sort of uh, proper conceptualization of this. Um, and we talk about the Kino example. Everybody in the room, I'm sure, is familiar with quinoa. And quinoa has been a really 
development disappointment. It's got great prices on the world market. It was first developed by fair trade organizations and organic product organizations. And subsequently, because it's a huge market in the United States and Europe, became a commodity. And there are all these price trends that are off the charts. And so everybody's trying to prove skin as fast as possible and abusing the environmental management practices of their ancestors and the, uh, of the, the, the organic uh, trade movement and sort of just going with a gold rush fever, getting quinoa to produce as much as possible, but the environment is being deteriorated. Soil losses, water contamination, monocropping, all the ills that we talk about with something like uh, soybeans now are happening with quinoa. And so this is very sad um, because this was a real opportunity for a more sustainable model that can involve a lot of farmers. A lot of, this is a real small farm of crop. It doesn't involve large uh, commercial enterprises producing it. And so we have this sector. So this is a real challenge and struggle. The president himself has mentioned that quinoa is having these problems and we need to do more about it. And the state needs to regulate, but the capacity is not there, unfortunately. And so we have to see um, through other combinations of networks and so forth, the state with the private sector, with uh, civil society organizations, the grassroots producers, we can come, come up with some more sustainable uh, models that can be replicated more widely and put a break on this process, which is leading to very serious environmental deterioration at a very rapid rate. And so, Kino was the one hope coming out of the Altiplano um, because of its fabulous prices and its, <coughs> its, uh, its attraction worldwide as, as important uh, planetary food. Um, and so, um, lessons need to be taken out of that, and we're hoping that that's that's going to be taken seriously. I think the chapters on coca, uh, John talks about the income gains, which are very uh, impressive. Investments in new housing, new services going into the areas, better roads. Um, but I think there's also, there. I think you understate the environmental deterioration from coca as well. And I think at the Yungas, we've had very serious breakdown of the ecosystems there. And I think President Morales has also spoken out on this issue uh, and, and said he's concerned about it, um, that Coke is increasingly, because of the price, it's going into marginal areas which you shouldn't be producing, and it's leading to um, soil uh, deterioration and the uh, collapse of ecosystems. And also, the Yungas, for example, its traditional role as a producer of citrus fruit and other fruits in the Paz markets has changed clearly. There's no more fruit in the Yungas, it's all going into coca. Um, and so, this is, has a negative impact on food production, food sovereignty. Um, and I think. Um, when we talk about the gains on coca, we have to sort of balance it with some of the environmental losses that are taking place and say here. Now, interestingly enough, there are groups calling for a coca organica, coca ecologica, and there are groups trying to produce an uh, 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 organic production process for coca that respects the ecosystems and the location where the plants are and so forth. Um, so, um, yeah, I just want to say, one other big question I'd like to really pose, and I think John was hinted at it in several places, he actually mentioned it quite explicitly, but I think um, it needs a big discussion, and that is, um, you know, does this social, this social kind of social transformation and rural political representation so broadly that we see, why is it not leading to this issue that's more sustainable rural production and production of employment in cities? Why is the production bottleneck still there for the rural? for the urban poor, in fact, for urban jobs and great jobs and manufacturing products and so forth. And I always <coughs> use the example of why, why is the uh, you know, employing distribution of American uh, used clothing from the United States employs far more people than any product in, product in enterprise in El Alto, even in Maquilas. Um, this is the informal sector. People buy and sell American used clothing, um, and it, but it's people sit on, sit on street corners, they sit in long streets and in, in rows and so forth and sell this as the main, you know, engine of of uh, self uh, self employment and uh, non formal self employment in, in El Alto, whereas you know, where is the productive employment that can really get you and give more stable jobs, full time jobs, um, and produce more um, from this this economy? Um, and this is, gets us to another issue, also in the rural areas. Um, and I've heard this over the years from people I respect and the people I've interviewed is. One of the problems that we're breaking this bottleneck on, uh, on highland production has been the prevalence of a syndicalista <coughs> mentality and culture over a more entrepreneurial spirit and culture. And this may come from years of being hypermobilized and facing off of the state and be a product of all this great social organization, but may have a downside that is really cramping the ability to take advantage of new economic opportunities and help these communities 
develop more broadly. So you see this being held back um, through not the government so much, but cultures in the communities that are more oriented toward um, mobilizing to get the state to build a new highway or a new health center rather than mobilizing to get their products to the market in an effective way. Now there are, I would say, new experiments going on involving universities, private sector, farmers organizations, NGOs, to develop better product quality, better productivity. The Catholic University has got some very interesting uh, dairy pro projects going on, uh, configurations with local uh, groups and, and um, other NGOs, and they are showing tremendous advance in getting high quality products to the best paying markets in La Paz and other markets. So, <coughs> so that's the, this cultural world culture problem may be uh, another bottleneck that the government's going to have to figure out how to deal with. Um, finally, I'd just like to say, um, you know, as somebody who teaches on indigenous movements, worked with a lot of indigenous people throughout the Americas, I know there was a lot of hope raised with the Ever Morales uh, processes, the Cambio commitment to do a more substantial land reform. And um, because so many other countries feel if it were done in Bolivia, we'd show how to do it there, perhaps we could create the political conditions to have it done in other Latin American countries, where we you know the record in the last 10, 15 years has been pretty meager. Um, can the Bolivians sort of lead the way with a government so committed to land reform, one who comes out of a whole program, an agenda, to elected office on the agenda for uh, major land reform in Santa Cruz. Um, and so we, at the end of the day, we don't have that. And uh, there was a retreat from land reform from the first agenda set up by the administration, the Morales government, to today, which is more of a um, making peace and working uh, favorably with the soybean producers and so forth. And, not pushing on that sort of land reform. The land conflicts now are between the highlands and the lowlands rather than with the lowland uh, elite in Santa Cruz. So the, the question is, and I think John gave a few explanations, but did the Santa Cruz landowner elite win the battle? Did the, the MAS sort of just give up and say, we, we, there are too much uh, at stake here. These people can mobilize really effectively. We've seen that in the large, the large uh, big uh, protest movements they had in the city of Santa Cruz and millions of people. Um, and politically, maybe it doesn't make any sense at this point. Um, and so uh, there was a retreat. Um, I was, and one of the, and I'm looking for explanations of why that occurred. And a, a, a government that uses Tupac Atari, Che Guevara, um, all these very powerful symbols of tra transforming uh, landowning systems and so forth. Why, why back off from this earlier commitment? What really happened? Is it the balance of Bolivia? Is it the balance of power with Santa Cruz? But I also wanted to ask, and I you didn't mention this, uh, as far as the Santa Cruz protecting its interests, um, the influence of Brazil, Brazilian government, Brazilian politics in Bolivia. And uh, I was wondering if that helped tip the balance away from doing a major land reform in Santa Cruz, perhaps because Brazilians have so much of the soybean uh, in, you know, production in Brazilian hands, as Brazilians are purchased a lot of, it's something 40 or 45 percent of Bolivian soybeans is in Brazilian hands, and that's the major agricultural export, and the one that has very favorable price trends, keeps growing and leads to more deforestation in the Amazon than any other any other agricultural product, copra, anything. They don't compare to soybean. So, so I'm saying, is Brazil a factor, the geopolitics of that, in preventing a more far-reaching uh, land reform that the Morales administration committed itself to back in 2006? John, would you like to make a very brief response to any of that? Um, before I open it up? Or? Well, why don't we see what the questions are and then we can come back. Okay. And, uh, yeah, and, okay. Yeah. We will take it to the floor then. Um, I would ask you please to identify yourself. There are many people in the room who know a lot about Bolivia or who are Bolivian, so I would like to encourage comments as well as questions. So just ask you to keep it brief uh, since there are so many people. Uh, my name is Pablo Villeda, regional director for Latin America with the International Justice Mission. We have a field office in um, La Paz. Um, and my, my question is whether as part of the research to write this book, uh, Sir Prophet, did you, did, did you come across uh, a sense from social, social movements and social organizations on the need to strengthen the public justice system um, as an organization, we think that, that without a strong public justice system, the gains of development cannot be sustained over the long term, particularly for the poor. 
Um, and our experience in Bolivia so far has been, uh, has led us to a lot of concerns uh, about the lack of prioritization to build a strong public justice system. We know that they're in the process of uh, reappointing uh, new judges and magistrates, the election of a magistrate's council uh, was a win for the government, but I was just wondering if that was a sense or did that come across as part of your conversation with social leaders or, or even politicians? Anyone else want to take a few questions if we can start? Cynthia? Yes, Cynthia contact with Washington University. Uh, I'd like to also ask about foreign policy issues. And you, know, you mentioned that uh, you know, Evo has uh, been nationalistic. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the relationship between Bolivia and Chile that's always been uh, tense. And in particular, it seems to me that there's been something of a rapprochement between Peru and Chile in the last couple of years, the Pacific Alliance. Is this anything of a concern? And how have those been responding to that? I, uh quite struck that we managed to get through an entire uh, presentation, two presentations on Bolivia, and nobody mentioned the United States. That's <laughs> 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 Tenzin Brazil. <laughs> some time ago. Oscar, and then we'll go. Yes, uh, thank you, Oscar, all the rest of the fellowship of the population, but mainly I'm an uh, independent activist. And uh, I wanted to ask the same question the gentleman asked already, but I have another one here. Uh, you mentioned uh, a very happy reality, which is the depth of the Bolivian people's militancy. Now, that is due to uh, a way of thinking. Yeah. So my question would be, what are traditionally the main ideological demands of the people of Bolivia in the streets who put Evo Morales in power and mass? That would be. What are the main demands of the, the people? Main ideological demands yeah. by the people in the streets. Mm. In, since 52, and especially since 2001. So why don't we go ahead and answer those, and then we'll start with three. Um, on the question of, of, of perceptions of, um, um, of the justice system, um, I mean, certainly one of the things that comes across from the interviews we did very strikingly, um, in the sense um, those people, is, suffer from um, the lack of um, a credible um, and effective um, justice system, not, but also you know, a police system in the sense that um, levels of public insecurity, social insecurity as such, are very high. And it certainly came across in many of the interviews that we conducted. More notably, I think, in urban areas than rural ones. I mean, we did interviews in El Alto, and we did interviews in, um, in Plantes Mill in, in Santa Cruz, uh, which is again another place I've never been to before, which was a, a real bright eye opener for me. But I mean, one of the things that unifies those two places is the um, feelings of insecurity that ordinary citizens suffer from particular um, problems of violence on the streets, of, of drugs, of alcoholism number, a range of, of, of social issues which um, um, are, not, are not really being dealt with and it possibly are getting worse as time goes by. Um, the um, weakness of the state, if you like, on the ground, in particular in terms of a, uh, a police presence to which people feel is a credible protection for them is palpably missing. Um, I mean, there are huge areas of, of a population with very, very few um, law and order people around. But I guess that your, your, your question was more sort of um, geared towards um, the other aspects of the justice system, the questions of, um, of the judiciary and how it operates, um, for whom many of the people we talk to I don't think had ever been in a system whereby um, you know, due access to judicial authorities was something that was a, 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 um, a reality for them. Um, and I don't think that's changed an awful lot. Um, and the people uh, feel, still feel, that um, the judicial system is largely inaccessible. Um, or at least it's only accessible to those who have the resources to pay um, to, um, to get the access that they require, uh, which for many of the people we were talking do not, fall into, do not fall into that category. So I mean, I think there's a problem there of, of access to the justice system. 
Um, there have been, as you know, um, attempts to change the way in which the um, Supreme Court is elected and chosen. There is a long history to um, issues of judicial corruption, and the idea that um, you make the um, judiciary subject to um, popular recall, if you like, rather than simply sort of unveiled kind of appointments, was you know, an attractive one in some respects. But whether it's not, I, I, I have no idea whether it's really led to any you know, def definite improvement in terms of the quality of, of the operations of the Supreme Court and so forth. I suspect not, but I, it's not, this is not something I was really looking at too much. Um, and the other area, of course, is, to, is the question um, of, um, of indigenous, indi indigenous justice, um, which is a very thorny issue, a very difficult one. Um, we were there at a time when, you know, after the law had been passed, um, uh, um, sanctioning um, the use of, of uh, um, traditional forms of justice in, in indigenous indigenous areas of the country. Um, but I must say, I don't think that um, the, the system had actually the new system was really up and up and up and going by the time we were, were talking to people. Um, and indeed, there are many problems in terms of actually defining the borders, the frontiers between one system of justice and another, and actually having two systems of justice working parallel in a single, single country is inherently problematic. Um, and I'm not sure whether this, this, this difficulty has been resolved or not, so I don't know if that's, that's sort of helpful. Um, on foreign policy issues, you mentioned the question of um, Bolivia and Chile, and um, uh, you know, the, the obvious, the, 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 change, the change that's taken place um, most recently, perhaps following the Peruvian example, is that the Bolivians have decided to take the issue of the access to the sea, um, Salida del Mar, um, to the International Court of Justice in The Hague, um, which in a sense um, sort of uh, puts the issue on the back burner for quite a long time because we all know that the, the ICJ moves at a snail's pace. I mean, the Peruvian case has been in before the ICJ for many years now, and they still haven't. Um, they probably will, soon. they will probably very soon say something, but, um, um, but I think it's an issue on which, um, um, you know, despite all their disagreements, is one of the issues on which Bolivians tend to agree, is that uh, um, we should have a sovereign access to the sea. Um, maybe not uh, um, the return of the land that was, uh, was taken in the war in the Pacific, but at least some sort of flag or something, some such, such arrangement by which Bolivia would have sovereign access. And of course, um, the Piñera administration in Chile has taken a much harder line on that issue um, than the Bachelet government did previously. Indeed, one of the, the, one of the, the um, slogans of the Piñera uh, campaign was ni millimetro de soberanía, <laughs> which of course you know, has a certain amount of echo in Chile, I guess. I mean, you know, the Chileans also feel quite strongly about this issue. Why should we be forced to cede territory to Bolivia. Um, so, I mean, I don't think that um, this is an issue that's going to resolve itself anytime soon. Um, let's hope it's, you know, something can come out of it um, before another 130 years or whatever it is uh, uh, passes. Um, but it's certainly an issue on which Bolivians can sort of rally around and, and all, you know, you can generate a degree of consensus in, in Bolivia around this particular issue, which is, of course, part of the kind of nationalistic uh, uh, tradition. I think, while well, you're thinking about the next question, I think it's very appropriate that we're having this discussion now because in Peru they're celebrating the Battle of Angamos. And it took me two years of living in Peru before I realized that the whole sh country shut down to commemorate this battle with, with Chile that they lost. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you think that, you know, they think that, that, that Peruvian history is sort of littered with defeats, well, Bolivian history is even more littered with defeats. So when you consider the loss of the loss of um, the access to the Pacific, the Chaco War, the loss of Acre to Brazil, I mean, Bolivia has been a sort of victim of being sort of gnawed away by its by its uh, by its neighbours over yeah. over a long period of time. Um, can we perhaps come back to the question of the U.S. I mean, yeah. um, now, what was the sort of um, what were the ideological demands um, that um, people had in electing Evo in 2005? Well, to a certain extent, this was the subject of the previous book. Um, the idea was 
to take a whole series of disparate uh, uh, movements um, around the country, which flourished in the period between 2000 and 2003, but extended onwards beyond 2003 to 2005. I mean, the, the Agenda de Octubre and all, all those things. And I think one of the, um, the great contributions of the mass um, um, and its great achievements, uh, successes, was the ability, if you like, to sort of to join up the dots of all these social movements, all these disparate social movements, and to provide a kind of ideological focus to them, um, particularly around you know the, 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 the twin ideologies, if you like, of, of, of nationalism and, uh, um, ref and reformism and, and, and indigenism. But it has to be said, and I think it's important to emphasize the fact that Evo himself does not come from an indigenista background. I mean, he comes from a very different kind of syndicalist, and he adopted many of the kind of um, appearances of, of, of indigenism when he, when, he, when he finally took office. Well, um, oh, actually, before when he was syndicato leader, they were a lot of Catalista temples in the early yeah. 90s as well. Yeah, yeah. but I mean, um, he himself comes from a rather different kind of, I and mean, this is one of the, of course, one of the difficulties in terms of, of dealing with the likes of um, Silov and Kolomak and so forth. So I think that, the, you know, in a sense, what the mass managed to do was to to take all these disparate movements and provide some sort of um, expression to them. And I think in this particular case, the question of the symbolic nature of Poker was terribly important as being not only something that the lowlands. Have you approached the uh, idea of uh, <coughs> there being still, of course, there is racism from the people in the lowlands and particularly about something which is uh, essential in Bolivia, because Bolivia is almost over 60% indigenous, the indigenous have a way of thinking, which is called uh, the uh, way to conceive the universe. Everything is connected. Uh, any, any opinions of the lowland people about that concept of the universe as seen by the indigenous of the, of the highlands? I'm sorry, I didn't see your name. Jess Lang, the former student. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The former student of the people in the room, so you expect they're doing. I now practice law in the area. Going back to your investment comments that you were making, I know that since 2006 there's been several other nationalizations, and I was wondering uh, if you get a little bit more of your insight on how that's affected development. Do you think that there's really like, the tax increase, that sort of thing, has had positive influence on development? Mm -hmm. Okay. Do we have to be out immediately on the dot of four? Or uh, we no, we're going to wait until the book is <laughs> oh, sorry, right. we're going yeah, to add one more question to the mix. Could be 4 a.m. <laughs> 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 we're in Bolivia, probably. Please, go ahead. Um, what are, um, I don't know if your book has, uh, uh, if you have that in your book, what are the main factors that there is a more of a economic movement, like um, more um, there is more like investment of um, the rural of the people that were in rural areas into the city. Um, how this uh, movement of money um, has so suddenly appeared? Um, I don't know if it makes sense. Yeah. Okay. No, I was, I was writing down actually while um, Kevin was talking. That we haven't talked about migration, and um, I think this is an important, obviously important issue. It's clearly related to the question of sustainable agriculture in the Altiplano. The Altiplano, over the years, has been an ex expelled uh, population, largely to um, the lowland part of Bolivia, but also to um, Buenos Aires, to Argentina. Um, and more recently to various various places in Europe and the United States. I mean, there's a big, a big um, um, I'm not sure exactly the number of, I mean, there's been a recent census, so I'm not sure exactly, the, with ten, there are 10 million Bolivians, but about of 10 million Bolivians, probably 3 million live outside Bolivia. So there's a big um, population. Um, and, and the amount of immigration into Bolivia 
apart from sort of seasonal immigration of tourists, which there are plenty, um, is very little, I would think. I don't know. I don't have any. I've not seen any figures on that. Some Colombians. Are a few Colombians are moving, a few Mexicans <laughs> may be moving in too, but um, yes, a few Peruvians are sort of um, shifting across the border with uh, um, bags of white powder in, in their pockets. Um, but no, I mean, the, the, the importance of, of migratory patterns is, is crucial to understanding lots of things in, in, in Bolivia, um, and not least to the, um, the development of, of, of Santa Cruz. Development of population in Santa Cruz. So as I said, as I said, I mean about half the population of Santa Cruz is a migrant population. Um, this is one of the reasons, of course, why the sort of elites of Santa Cruz feel that they're living to a certain extent on borrowed time, and that reflects itself in support for the mass, which is a, an organisation in Santa Cruz which is almost entirely supported by migrant populations. It's, um, its support is notably in, in, in those sectors. You can look at the areas of migration and look at the voting patterns and the correlation is pretty clear that the mass is something, and as one of um, um, Hugo Salvatier, who was the previously the Ministry of Agriculture, told us um, that of the, 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 um, the local committee of the, of the mass in Santa Cruz, he was the only person who was a Crusadian. Um, tells you something about it. Anyway, there's a, there's a um, really? yeah, uh, or, I mean, born in, born in Cruz, Santa Cruz, um, so, I mean, the migratory patterns are an important element both of um, shifts of labor in terms of the economy, uh, because, I mean, Santa Cruz has tended to sort of, the, the agriculture um, was opened up by, by colonizers in the 1970s, 60s, and 70s, going from the 1950s, but also has a political aspect to it, which is very important. So I think that uh, migration is important. It's also worth saying, I suppose, in passing, that um, the question of remittances from um, Bolivians living abroad is an important <coughs> element of the balance of payments. I'm not sure, I can't remember exactly what they, what they are and whether they've been bad. I get the impression they haven't been too badly affected by events in Spain, but uh, um, a lot of that money coming from remittances comes from Spain. Um, and you would think that Bolivians are the first to get um, thrown on the, on the employment uh, rubbish pit in Spain these days, but I'm not sure, I don't know. Then there was um, uh, Rob's question about um, uh, the, 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 the fault lines within the, uh, the mass. I mean, obviously the mass as it's evolved has been a kind of alliance, um, but it was an alliance in which the, um, in terms of the structure of the party at least, where the, the um, urban middle class elements which joined the mass prior to 2005 was sort of late, came quite late to the party. Um, and this, I think, reflected um, the fact that uh, levels of discontent with the traditional party system, which was very profound by it's one of the elements, I think, in the sort of collapse of what you might call the Ancien Regime, I mean, the, the, what came before 2005, was that um, the party system simply imploded parties became a dirty word, and that's the reason, one of the reasons that the, mo the mass actually does not call itself a political party, but it calls itself formally the Instrumento Politico, which is a, a, is a, a deliberate use of words to say we're well, not a political party, but the political parties have such a bad, bad reputation. But I mean, the middle class vote um, for the mass was, um, was evident in, in the 2002 elections, um, but even more so in, in the became was between 2002 and the elections at the end of 2005. Now, it's always been a slightly uneasy alliance, I think, um, and I think there's always been a source of tension. I mean, certainly there are those within the mass who think, think that the middle class elements of the, of the party structure have become too powerful, and often this is something that's directed to the vice president, uh, um, Alvaro Garcia Lenin, um, who is seen sort of in a sense to sort of represent whiteness and middle classness and uh, intellectualness and all, all those things, you know, which is very valuable. He's actually been extraordinarily valuable, I would say, in terms of a sort of, of, a, of a running uh, a factor of unity in terms between, between the, uh, within the mass, in terms of you know, providing a link between these two disparate sectors. But it's, you know, the, the, the unity of the mass has suffered very badly in, in recent times. Um, first of all, there was the collapse of the, the Pacto de Unidad, Pacto de Unidad was a sort of a pacto between um, uh, 
broadly speaking, sort of a campesino um, groups um, uh, of the Altiplano and um, the, the valleys, uh, the colonization, including the, the Cotaleros from the, from, from the highlands, um, and the indigenous, uh, the pro-indigenous movements, indigenista movements, the Cidob in the lowlands, um, which always maintained a certain different distance from the mass, and the Konamak, which has also had a rather kind of troubled existence for the mass, but it was it came within the both <coughs> organizations came within the Pacto de Unidad in I think when it was signed in 2004, I think, or 2000, I think 2003. Um, but the role of the middle class in this particular structure has always been very ambivalent, and I think that um, um, it was a very this was an interesting moment um, when. Um, Juan del Granado decided to split off uh, from the uh, from the mass, and then up till uh, I'm not sure, 2008, 2009, I'm not sure, maybe it was 2010, when he finally um, set set up the Movimiento Sin Miedo, which was a group which explicitly sort of projected itself towards an increasingly disillusioned uh, middle class, um, very di very differentiated middle class, I would say too. I mean, uh, but in in Paseño terms. And there are there, there are certainly a lot of people in the middle class who feel that they have been displaced from the centres of decision making, and I think that's been very clear from, from the start. But um, I think that's you know, particularly particularly the concentration of, of decision making in Evo's in Evo's hands. I mean, he's uh, in a sense that, um, is the person who finally has the final say on, on what happens. And the, the various sort of middle class organisations which have had traditionally a, a, a strong inroads in terms of policy making. This is no particularly, it's particularly evident in some of the sort of NG, the NGOs, and we were talking a bit about this over lunch, you know, how, how the NGOs have become very disenchanted and the relationship between NGOs are quite important in terms of tradition, in terms of some of the political muscle and their involved in party politics over the years, has um, you know, brought this level of, of, so I mean, I think there is a, uh, uh, there, there are systems there, there are difficulties there. But on the other hand, you have to take into account there is no opposition. I mean, in the sense, if you're, and this relates, I think, to the, to the point, of the, the, the question about um, um, the electoral, likely electoral results in, in, in 2014. I mean, the opposition is conspicuous by its absence. Um, and the only figures that seem to have any kind of um, traction in terms of politics is uh, um, uh, Juan del Granado, um, but his. His, his uh, um, political base is, is, is very much centered in Santa in, in La Paz and does not, does not transfer much outside the boundaries of La Paz. And um, Samuel Doria Medina, and Samuel Doria Medina, I think, got sort of 5% in the last election or so. He was a sort of you know, successful businessman. I mean, very difficult to be a successful businessman talking the language of successful business and to go down well with the kind of constituency which represents the majority of Bolivian voters. So, I mean, you know, I think when you're, when you're thinking about what other options there are, that probably people will start in, come back and probably vote for the mass photo mirror. You know? um, so, um, I think this was Alejandro's question, wasn't it? It was about the elections, yeah. Um, I mean, I, I think that um, it's probable that uh, Evo won't get the same degree of support um, as he did last time, but he's made it very clear that he hopes he, he, he's going to, to rev up his, 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 uh, in his campaign to try and at least equal the percentage of the vote he got in the 2009 elections, which I think was something like 70% um, or something, I can't remember the exact figure, but it was very slim. I think he's actually said, I, I'm aiming to get 74%. I mean, maybe saying that out loud is not just a really good idea. But, um, uh, I think it's difficult. Um, and of course, one of the things that's at stake here is whether or not um, the mass will retain its two-thirds majority plus at this moment um, in, both, in both, both, um, both houses of, um, of the Congress, or the, uh, national, the plurinational legislative assemblies, it's called these days. Um, and that may matter because without that two-thirds majority, you know, you can't, you, if you wanted to change the constitution in any respect, then he's involved in a difficult. I mean, a lot happens. A lot will rest on, I think, you know, looking forward as to 
what point does it ever seek to exit the, the, the political system? Uh, you, know, you, know, you can see the logic of the need to, to look for a political exit, but actually doing it is very difficult. So um, I, I, I see Evo. I, I see you know, Evo will win the elections without a doubt. Um, I can't see any. There's no alternatives. There's much on offer. Um, but it may not win it with quite the enthusiastic level of support that's been, been was around in, in, in uh, 2005, 2009. Um, and I think that may be one of the problems: is that governments that are in office for a long period of time eventually lose impetus. They lose. They lose the kind of when you come back for more and more, uh, ultimately people say, you know, enough is enough, you know. But that, I don't think, because we've reached that stage yet. Uh, the water crisis and climate change. Um, yes, this is a, a problem. I think it's a problem that's not properly uh, appreciated as being a problem. Um, I mean, while the, the glaciers are still melting, um, the water trickles down from them, and so the, you know, the immediate area of, of, of water shortage is something that's not been experienced on a sustainable, sustained basis um, as of um, as up to now. Um, but of course, everybody knows that you know, sooner or later, um, this is a major source of, of water for um, both Cochabamba and uh, La Paz. Um, that um, and, and the investment is not going in to um, open up alternative sources of water supply. And meanwhile, of course, cities like El Alto remains one of the Worlds. Ah, the books are here. Okay. <laughs> um, remain uh, um, some of Latin America's fastest growing cities. So, I mean, there is a, you know, a huge problem there eventually. Uh, quite what problem it becomes a, a, an urgent problem, I'm not sure, but I don't get the feeling that enough is being done to sort of to, 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 to manage it. Of course, Bolivia, like other Andean countries, is, is, is also the victim of climate change in other ways particularly in terms of, of climatic unpredictability. And this is, of course, devastating, as it can have devastating impacts on peasant economies, since the, you know, the, the, the regularity with which peasants have managed to sort of mitigate the difficulties over the centuries of, of, a, of a peasant economy through temporary migrations and so forth. Um, that is beginning to break down, and there are certainly interesting, I mean, my co-author Anne Chaplin's done some interesting work on, on some of this in the anti planet Yeah. Wrap up on the final questions, John. Yep, yeah. there's racism in the lowlands, which is certainly a big, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a big issue. Um, um, the racism has always been very strong in Santa Cruz, but I think things are beginning to change. There are some bastions which are no longer quite as bastiony as they were um, mm -hmm. in, in previous times, um, and I think that um, Santa, Santa Cruz is bit by bit becoming a more inclusive sort of city. But I think this is again one of the interesting changes that we picked up on. That I mean, certainly there are racist. We didn't spend much of time talking to, to elites, but I mean certainly the racist sentiments exist. Um, but I think that people are beginning to realise that, um, that the nature of Santa, the Santa Cruz society is, is changing and, and is changing in ways that are not going to be you know, irrevocable. And um, that some of the, 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 the preserves of, of Cruceño whiteness is are no longer quite as as, as, as um, structured kind of bastions as, as they used to be. And the, the university is a good interesting interesting um, case of that. Um, the, the, the Gabriel Moreno University used to be a sort of, you, know, you had to be born and bred in Santa Cruz to, 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 to go to it. That's no longer the case. I mean, it's, you know, there are areas where these kind of institutions are being forced, probably grudgingly and with lots of difficulties, but are being forced to adapt to, to new realities. So I don't really, I think, um, the question about other nationalizations. I mean, tend to, the, the, I think that there's a there's a a, a, um, a distinction to be drawn between and has always been drawn between the renationalization in inverted commas because it's not always renationalization, but, but the renationalization of those companies <coughs> that were capitalized under the um, Sanchez de Rosada government, which was basically as I well, yes, it, it, um, hydrocarbons was by far the most important. Um, but there was also electricity, um, um, railways, and one or two other other sectors. But these were uh, um, these have been sort of in which the 
under the, the laws of capitalization, <coughs> they were 51% or 50% plus a little bit uh, um, owned by foreign companies, but it was not 100% ownership. And this made it much easier to, to revert those, the, the, that national ownership. Now, there have been various other nationalizations, many of which have resulted from individual kind of protests. I mean, the renationalization of Kolkiri, for example, is an interesting is a case in point. Malku Kota, which is another mining pot or sea, where the, where the local people, the Kotlitavistas, there's been a struggle going on to, um, against the um, um, activities of, of, of foreign multinationals, mining multinationals, um, particularly in terms of the terms under which um, mining is conducted and the, and the, and the, the proceeds of mine, mines are distributed amongst local people, which is a perennial um, for source, of, source of conflict. Um, and there have been the you know, moments which the government had to respond to these things and say, okay, well, it's a temporary crisis, we will nationalize it. But it didn't really form part of a program, I don't think, of these impromptu nationalizations. Now, really, if you're looking around, there isn't an awful, too much left to nationalize, I don't think. I mean, it's, uh, you know. Um, so I, I think that probably um, this particular sort of element of sort of economic nationalism is likely to sort of decline simply by virtue of the fact that. Uh, the companies which are foreign owned, which are active, are critically important. The big ones are critically important to the economy, and they're not going to nationalize them. I mean, the, the Sumitomo, for example, which owns San Cristobo, the biggest mine by far in Bolivia. I mean, there's no way that the government is going to nationalize. It's too important in terms of the revenue that it generates. John, I think there was that one last question, but very, very brief, on the transfers. From Movements of money. Yeah. Well, I think one of the things that actually need to, perhaps I should have said, and, and I think it's, it, it uh, relates to this question, um, is the question of the development of what you might call a sort of new indigenous bourgeoisie, in, particularly in El Alto. You don't have to look any further than some of the buildings that have gone up in El Alto in recent years to realize there's a lot of money around, um, some of which uh, you know, of fairly shady origins, probably, you know, in terms of um, El Alto is a sort of den of, uh, of some, uh, a free trade in a way, I mean, a sort of good contraband trafficking of, of goods of one kind or another. You don't have to go further than the market to which you alluded to, you know, where they sell, uh, can they, I bought a very fine Canadian shirt in that market. <laughs> very nice and thick, very good for them. <laughs> um, but uh, there are mass of commercial um, interests in, in, um, in El Alto, um, totally informal in the way they operate, but certainly they generate large amounts of money. And then there's obviously some kind of speculation that there may be you know, there people in, involved in other sort of more nefarious kind of activities, um, but I don't have any sort of data on, on that. But you can certainly see from the amount of money that people spend, and they don't necessarily spend it in the way that old elites used to spend money, they spend it on fiestas and they spend it on, you know, you go to Gran Poder, for example, the amount of money that people spend on costumes and so forth. Impressive, you know. The amount of money spent on beer is impressive. <laughs> <laughs> um, and that's one thing they won't nationalize, I don't think. <laughs> so I think that there's evidently uh, um, a, a wealthy class developing um, in amongst indigenous people in an urban context. And this is, of course, one of the things that is probably accelerating migration because it becomes a kind of pool factor for people to come think, well, you know, um, I will go and work with my compadre from community, whatever you come from, and, you know, uh, and, and hopefully some of this, this income might come my way too. So we need to wrap up here, but I want to give Kevin a chance to well, I just say we final haven't, comments. We didn't mention cultural activities promoted by the mass government, which have been a huge uh, set of activities that we've seen previous governments on their television stations. Musicians are receiving all kinds of money from the state for all kinds of performances and activities that they're doing and so forth. So I think in a cultural realm, too, cultural policy is really changing Bolivia toward a more plurinationalistic, pluricultural kind of focus and trying to work with all these groups. And also um, recognizing some of the best weaving in the countries and giving awards to weavers. That was never done before. These are all changes trying to incorporate that in this subterranean culture system. Well, this has been a rich and fascinating discussion. Um, in closing, I want to recognize a, a few people. First of all, he didn't ask a question, so I'm going to point him out. Father Michael Gilgannon, who's sitting in the back, worked in La Paz for 38 years, 38 years was a very, very close colleague of Wola's, 
He was my source of information for years on what was happening in, in Bolivia. We're just really thrilled that coincidentally you were in Washington today and could join us. I'd like to thank Adam for running across town to get the books. <laughs> and we now have the books. They are out on this table. Um, as soon as we wrap up here, someone will rush out there to sell them to you. And I would just like to thank John and Kevin for a fascinating discussion today and to thank all of you for coming. Thank you.